last year's, uh, last summer's debacle with the uh, state Supreme Court declaring that uh, our con that our Secretary of State could not publish the uh, ballots as directed by law. And I was making a lot of constitutional arguments in that case, and one of my compatriots, uh, Paul Mursky, said, I really ought to start writing these things down. So I did. And by Christmas I had completed the first draft of what I call the People's Liberty. And that, was, that began in September of last year, so it's hardly more than a year old. I have it for you on CD, out in the front. It is there free of charge. It is a gift. Now, I would greatly appreciate a gift in oh, return. Oh, bag of chips. Because this has consumed a lot of my time. But it is, it is free for you to take if you don't have, I don't know, five, ten, fifteen dollars. That's fine. Just take it. And it's free for you to copy and give it to your friends. Because far more important than anything else is um, that the message get out. That's, that's the most important. Also, you will find on your tables for you, brought to you at no great expense, and I mean that literally because I picked them up for free uh, from the State Archives building, is a copy of what we call the State Constitution. It also has a copy of the Federal Constitution. Notwithstanding, there are some errors in it. Um, most notably, there's a comma in uh, the Federal Bill of Rights in Article 2 that really ought to be there. And if you read it to yourself, you would say, that ought to be there. It's not grammatically correct. Um, also, uh, it does state that we have the Constitution for, of the United States of America, and that is not correct. Right. Having observed the ratification document in the State Archives, it is the Constitution for the United States of America. And there is a significant difference because if you go to the words, something that is of means proceeding from. Ours is the Constitution of the State of New Hampshire because we are self-constituted. For means provided for. Um, accoutrements for the use of the Army. We have the Constitution for the United States of America. It was something prepared by the states and their residents for the execution of the general government. Uh, also, I have recently found out that all of the Constitution existed prior to about 75 years ago. The proper nouns in the Constitution are capitalized. Uh, they are not presented as capitalized, and I would uh, consider that an, adulter an unlawful adulteration of the Constitution. Knowing that I have a good friend in Bill Gardner, I am confident that in the next edition, uh, the Constitution will be presented properly, as well the word for be replaced, be replacing the word of. Now, all that said, the first part of what I'm going to be talking to you about today is going to be pretty much historical. When I began on this whole endeavor a year ago, well, actually when I began to train James Madison even before that, one of the things I tried to do was to put myself in the place of those men who were founding the country. You can't understand the Constitution <coughs> unless you understand how they thought. You can't be. Madison said that the Constitution, unless amended, must be interpreted according to the meanings of the words as they were commonly understood when they were adopted. And that, that there's a whole context within which these documents were prepared. So you can't, un you can't understand what they meant until you figure out how they thought, why they thought. And there's a whole context of what was going on <coughs> on this continent in 1776 that depended on times prior. Just as, as we reference ourselves to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for the United States of America, they were thinking back to things that had happened in their historical past. And despite the difficulties we may have with the world of Islam at this moment, it would be no, small, no <coughs> great stretch to say that American government proceeds indirectly out of aggression by Islam. And where this all begins is the end of the 1400s, 15th century. And up until that time, Europe was entirely hierarchical. The church was hierarchical. The government was hierarchical. Okay, everything was imposed top down.
to the extent that um, if, if you were under the uh, control of a local lord and you got married, the local lord had the right to a bride on her wedding night. You see this in the beginning of the Patriot. This is how life was, and this was a worldview that was supported by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church was at that time working with what they called the Latinized Bible. All the scriptures had been translated into Latin. It was read only in Latin. Most of the people didn't understand Latin. Even uh, the, the, when Martin Luther first put it into the German language, it was translated from the Latin. Now, all of a sudden, in the late 1400s, the Muslims invaded and conquered Constantinople. And all of the Christian scholars of the, Greek, of the Orthodox Church fled to Western Europe. At that same time, we're experiencing the Reformation in Germany and England. And people like John Calvin were fled at the point of a sword from England. And the two met in Geneva. And all of a sudden, Martin, uh, John Calvin and his compatriots were faced with all of these Greek and Hebrew scriptures. They weren't translated, they were the genuine article. And they started translating the Greek and Hebrew into English. Now most of you who attend a Protestant church have likely been told that the King James Bible was the first English Bible and it was the first Bible to be uh, divided into chapter and verse. Not so. This is a Geneva Bible. First published in 1539. It is divided into chapter and verse, written in English. It was also highly, highly common, commentated for the average person. And this is the Bible that was prevailing in England in the late 1500s. And everybody was reading it, and there was great commentary. I mean, if you look in the New Testament, half the book is commentary. And that commentary was a new view on the scriptures. They were looking at things like the apostles saying, should we obey men rather than God? And they're saying, hmm, is there a divine right? They look at the Hebrew midwives uh, defying uh, uh, Pharaoh. And they said, they did right to defy Pharaoh because Pharaoh was acting counter to God. Now, they weren't right to lie to Pharaoh as to their reason. They should have been up front, but it was right for them not to have obeyed. You go to Matthew uh, chapter 20 and, and they say, uh, let he who is greatest among you be as the younger and uh, he who governs as he who serves, and servant leadership. They took that to heart. This is the Bible that crossed the Atlantic with the pilgrims. They ascribed to the Geneva Bible. 1611 now, King James doesn't really like all this no more divine right of king stuff. And so he authorizes the King James Bible. And there are some subtle differences. Well, I will show you one. But most importantly, no commentary. The interpretation was wholly left to the church. Now, this is the world in which our the, the, you know, if you will, the rear view mirror of our founders. 1628, how many of you have heard of the uh, English uh, Civil War? Okay, three, four. Okay, English Civil War, Lord Cromwell, ascribed to the Geneva Bible. What was the primary complaint that inspired the English Civil War? Taxation without representation. With an unjust king, Lord Cromwell saw that it was there was a right to depose the king if he couldn't be brought into line with scripture. This is an important train of thought. 1688, we had the English Bill of Rights. And actually the majority of our Bill of Rights in our Constitution harkens back to the English Bill of Rights. 
this this is the this is the groundwork that laid the foundation for American government. And what led me to this, I had already written the first draft of even of uh, the People's Liberty, and I was looking at Article Six. Now, Article Six originally read that um, I'll I'll read it because I've got it in here. I don't want to mess it up. But it presented a conflict in my mind. And I really, part of what I'll show you in the Constitution is you can't interpret any article of the Constitution, really any word of the Constitution, without it being consistent with any other word or article that impinges upon it. You can't take it out of context. So it read, as morality and piety rightly grounded on evangelical principles, will give the best and greatest security to government and lay in the hearts of men the strongest obligations to due subjection. And I thought that a very strange phrase. What did they mean by, what, what were these evangelical principles and what subjection? Because that obviously, in its most simple understanding, and I think the understanding that led to its removal, doesn't jive with whenever the ends of government are perverted and the public liberty manifestly endangered and all other means of redress ineffectual, the people may, and of a right ought, and ought is the moral imperative, lost my place, to reform the old or establish a new government. Well, that doesn't speak of subjection, at least not to the government, does it? So how do you resolve these two ideas? We go back to evangelical principles. Remember, they were working out of the Geneva Bible, which really focused on personal responsibility before God, that you had to obey God before you obeyed men. So what's the subjection? We look at uh, that, he, let he who governs be as he who serves. What's the subjection? Let's look at Article 7 before we go any further. Because it also provides... Uh, the people are sovereign. The people are sovereign, but let's just... What does it, um, I'm sorry, maybe it's, no, I'm sorry, it's Article 8. All power residing in the people, originally in and being derived from the people, all the magistrates and officers of government are their substitutes and agents. So who is subject to whom? What, there's, what they were saying, the due subjection of, that was enlightened by evangelical principles, was the subjection of everybody to God and the subjection of those in government to the people. Well, all of a sudden we see that if you were really adhering to what they refer to as evangelical principles, and it's not a religious idea, it's an idea of government. What brought me to this was, what is the what was the real salient difference, singular distinction, between the hierarchical churches, like Roman Catholicism, Church of England, Lutheran Church, and the evangelical churches, Presbyterianism, Congregationalism, uh, Baptists, the hierarchical churches appoint their local pastors. Evangelical churches elect their pastors. This, this is what led me to the real idea. What were they saying? They weren't talking about theology when they said evangelical principles. They were talking about a view of government, whether it be church government or civil government. Uh, a lot of the other constitutions refer to it as evangelical principles. And this brings us to another interesting characteristic of the New Hampshire Constitution. We had the first constitution <coughs> on this side of the Atlantic. In January of 1775, uh, the governor left and our people said, hmm, we don't have a governor anymore. We're independent. We darn well better have a charter for our government. And they wrote a constitution. Simple. And it was in, it was actually written as a temporary constitution. It said, and I'm paraphrasing, but it said, this is for the emergency circumstances of the war. Now, shortly after that, during 76 and 77, all of the states wrote constitutions. We then after the fact, get to 1779, and a gentleman by the name of John Langdon, who was Speaker of the House during the uh, Revolutionary War, generally, 
uh, started calling for a constitutional convention. This constitutional convention was unique, and it prepared a unique form of government because all of the other constitutions, the constitutions were prepared by the legislature, that is the lawmaking bodies. We were the first government to elect a separate body, even if it contained a good many legislators, it was a body elected separate from the legislature to draft a constitution and then put it before the people for ratification. And that constitution, we didn't pass our first one. The first one uh, was a, you might say, a very, uh, what, actually the first one was really a, a opportunity for the people to ratify the government that was in place, which had a high concentration of power. The president of the Senate, who was president of the state, was also chief justice of the court. Okay. It, was, it was a very concentrated power, and the people rejected it. So they wrote another one in 1781, and this was very a very liberal government in its form of government. I don't know what the Bill of Rights were that different, but the people rejected it. 1783 came along, and we got what we principally have now. More con it's a more concentrated government than we have now, but it was generally the same. And the people ratified it. Again, the people are the sovereigns of the state, and that's what our Constitution says repeatedly, over and over and over again. It puts the people in the control. All government of right, all legitimate government is founded in consent. All power originates with the people. Uh, Madison, in his arguments on the, on the Bill of Rights, refers to the people as the sovereigns. This is in our first National Congress. The, this, this whole idea of self-government is what makes American government unique. Madison described it as, in all other governments, liberty came from power. That is, you had only that liberty that was granted by the government. America, power comes from liberty. That's an extremely different worldview. And you couldn't have gotten there without be, having begun at evangelical principles, which says God is no respecter of persons. There's, there's no one who's better than any, intrinsically better than anyone else. As our Constitution says, that all more men are born equally free and independent. The first ten articles of our Constitution come directly out of the evangelical principles. The remainder come out of the English Bill of Rights. And that is, that is the framework, that the worldview that you have to understand when you're attempting to understand our Constitution. You, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't see where they wanted to go without understanding where they were. So where does this lead us? I want to focus on, first, on Article 37. I want to focus first on Article 37. I'm sorry, Article 38. Social virtues inculcated. A frequent recurrence, that's to go back, study, read, discuss. A frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles of the Constitution, what well, we just learned what those were. And a constant adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, industry, and frugality, and all the social virtues are indispensably necessary to the pres preserve the blessings of liberty and good government. The people ought, there again is that moral imperative, it doesn't show up very often, Therefore, to have a particular regard to all those principles and the choice of their officers and representatives. And they have a right, a right, to expect an exact and constant conformance, observance of them in the formation and execution of the laws necessary for good administration of government. An exact and constant observance of them. And you have a you have a right. That means you can, can you you can enforce the adherence to these principles upon the legislature. 
upon the executive, upon the judiciary. Another uh, idea that I'd like to dispel, we constantly hear over and over again, three co-equal powers of government. Why? Is it mentioned any place? Are they anywhere described as, as co-equal? In the federal government, if there's anything in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton, an advocate of the judiciary, describes the judiciary as the weakest branch. But what does our Constitution say about it? And this is another thing that was unique about our Constitution. Remember I said that we had the first and the last. And a gentleman who had a lot to say on these matters noticed that. His name was James Madison. In Federalist Paper 47, he talks about how we had the last Constitution, and therefore we made some important corrections compared to the previous constitutions. What would some of these corrections be? Well, in Article 83, unlike Massachusetts, who said that the legislature shall cherish such things as education, we said legislators. Well, the Supreme Court attributed that to a scribe's error. Must have been a mistake. But there's an important difference. If it's the legislature, then it's the lawmaking body that is obligated. If it's a legislator, a legislator doesn't pass a law. The most he can do is vote. He just has to keep it in his forethought, his oratory. It's an exhortation. But if we think that they were careless and would have just left such a typographical <coughs> error, one has to go back and look at the Constitution of 1792. We have the parchment version over in the archives. And I forget where, which one got it corrected, but both in Article uh, 7, in the first part, and Article 1, in the second part, we describe our, ourselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, or body politic in the second part. Well, in one of them, and I don't remember which, they left out the word sovereign. And you can see on the parchment where they put a little carrot, sovereign. So don't think that they left anything out or left anything mistaken that they wouldn't have corrected. They went through and somebody said, oh, we dropped a word. So they, so they typographically corrected it in on the sheepskin. Article 37. Now Madison makes mention of this because all the other constitutions, what he's talking about in, our, in Federalist Paper 47 is the separation of powers. And in 1819, and I won't go into it now, but our Supreme Judicial Court, whatever it was at the time, because it had multitudes of names, intentionally, I have to believe intentionally, misrepresented what Madison said. They, it wouldn't even be fair to say they quoted him out of context, they misquoted it, and used it as a method to rob the people of a portion of their liberty. But what he was talking about in Federal's Paper 47 is all the other state constitutions pres prescribed an absolute separation of powers. And then went on to describe a commingling of powers, whether it was the ability to impeach or remove by bill of address, veto, override of veto, um, all these types of comminglings. And that, of course, is not consistent with an absolute separation of powers. But we were so brilliant because we were looking in 2020 hindsight that we said, in the government of this state, the three essential powers thereof, to wit, the legislative, executive, and judicial ought to be kept as separate from and as independent of each other as the nature of a free government will admit, or as is consistent with that chain of connection that binds the whole fabric of the Constitution in one indissoluble bond of amity and unity. Now that's first of all where we where it's inextricably put into the Constitution that you can't look at one part separate from another part. It is one fabric, it's interwoven of unity and amity, so it is it is all self consistent. Every part agrees with every other part. You won't find it in self conflict. Unless someone's so stupid as to put an amendment in that causes it. Um, but certainly at the time that that was put in, and that has not been altered since 1784, it was considered to be one indissoluble bond of unity and amity, one fabric. And 
and that's a really important concept. Go backward, that those departments need to be kept as separate as free government will admit, which means that to have a free government, you must have some commingling of powers, the ability of one branch to check another, and that the relative power of the different branches can be found in the fabric of the Constitution, as is consistent. As is consistent, let's see, with the chains of connection that bind the whole fabric. So if we wanted to go and find out which branch of government, for instance, was the most powerful, all we need to do is go and read the second part. And I always, always describe it as this part. The Bill of Rights is the skeleton. It, it forms the basic structure. The form of government is the flesh. It is there to give power in order to protect those rights described in the first part. So if I want to find out what how the, the relative powers of the different agencies of government, then I need to go to the second part and see how they interplay with each other. And I have done that here. I don't have a whiteboard, so I can't do it for you actively. But this is something I use to, to teach the kids in grade school. A picture. You have the three branches of government. And I go through with the with the kids and I say, okay, what power does you know the judiciary have over the legislature? What power does the legislature have over the judiciary? Uh, what special powers does either chamber of the house have? And when you go through, and I sometimes I do it one way or the other, you know, drawing an arrow of power one over the other. And uh, then you look at who has the most arrows originating from it. That, that would be the one with the most power, because they have power over other branches. You will find that the House of Representatives has the most power. Only two special powers. The power to impeach and the power to draft money bills which are not available to the Senate. Now, the Senate can edit them, not approve them, but they can't originate them. There is nothing unique that the Senate can originate. The Senate and the House together as a legislature have more power than the governor, because they, in addition to being able to override a veto, they have the power to impeach or remove by bill of address. And similarly, both the legislature and the executive have more power than the judiciary because the uh, judges can only be appointed to the judiciary by the executive. And of course, we can always remove any judge by bill of address or impeachment. And if you go back to the Constitution unamended, the legislature had complete authority over the judiciary because we had the authority to erect and constitute all the judicatories of the state. With the power to create comes the power to destroy. And five times in the history of this state, the legislature did obliterate the judiciary and constitute new judicatories. Now, unfortunately, this turned out to be harmful in the long run. Not for the reasons you might think, but mostly because when this happened, it happened as a political move. Only once did it not happen as a political move. It happened because the legislature changed hands, like happened last term. And we went from Republican to Democrat. I think they went from um, Federalist to Republican Democrat. And then two terms later, two years, they went back. And each this is in 1819. And each time, the prevailing party removed the judiciary and replaced them. And it happened again in the early uh, 1870s. And we, uh, I don't remember what the prevailing parties were, but they flip-flopped twice. And, and uh, each time they flip-flopped, they obliterated the judiciary. And when they, when they had done so, we had uh, decisions come out of the judiciary that were absolutely abominable. And I think principally because there was no institutional memory. The legislature had been replaced, so they had no memory of what had happened before. The judiciary had been replaced twice, so they had no memory of what had happened before. 
And so common practices were lost. And the people who lost were the people. In the first time in 1819, um, what we lost was the right of redress against judicial uh, decisions. And in the second one in the 1870s, we lost the right to trial by jury in new types of civil cases, which translates forward to traffic violations, termination of parental rights, and such uh, things. Because those are all prosecuted as civil violations. And if you read the Constitution, if you read the Constitution, it hasn't been amended. It says that you have a right to trial by jury in all civil case, cases between two persons where the value is more than $1,500 and doesn't involve um, uh, land, real estate, uh, unless there was another practice at the time the Constitution was written. And this will be held sacred. I think they thought it was important. But in 1874, the judiciary said, it is everywhere construed, based on the Wisconsin Constitution, uh, that you have a right to trial by jury if that was the case when the Constitution was written. That's a huge loss of sovereignty. But I'm getting off the track. But what we establish is that when they said the three powers of government to wit, the legislative, executive, and judicial, I don't think the order was arbitrary. Because it happens to follow the order of power which they gave the three powers of government. And is there a rationale to this? Well, if you look at it, those to whom they gave the most power, the House of Representatives, were the ones most closely connected to the people. As you get further and further from direct power of the people, you have less and less power. Does that flow from the theory of American government that the people are the sovereigns? It does. So now that we've, it's odd that they put those in the back, but now that we've, we've laid the basic groundwork for what our government, the sanctity of our government is, I guess you'd say, let's start looking at the first articles. <coughs> Article one, 1, all men are born equally free and independent, and therefore all government of right, legitimate government, that's parenthetical, originates from the people, is founded in consent, and instituted for the general good. Government is founded in consent. We ratified the Constitution, and two-thirds of the people agreed with it. So this government did not affect, come into effect until the people ratified it. And in fact, if you look at it, we rejected two previous constitutions. It didn't come into effect until we ratified it, until we consented. And it's founded for the general good. What does general good mean? General good is, ge is generally construed to mean that all actions of the government must apply equally to all at the same time. And there is, again, in that chain of connection, let's look at Article 10. Not the first part, or not the second part of it that I read, but the first part of it, which sounds eerily similar. Government being instituted for the common benefit, sounds like common good. Protection and security of the whole community and not for the private interest or emolument, that's enrichment, of any one man, family, or class of men. That means you can't write laws that give, that are designed to give benefit to one person or even one group of people. So can you write a law that says, We'll put a casino in Littleton and a casino in uh, Hampton. No. no, no. Because they benefit specific communities. It also only benefits a very limited number of, of uh, companies. At most, two. Maybe only one. We have, that's, that's what's wrong with the casino bills that are before us today. Also, they don't really conform to uh, the, the latter, to uh, Article 38 either, because 
the, the type of activities that casinos generate can't be generally construed to promote moderation, temperance, industry, or frugality. <laughs> so, I mean, which isn't to say you can't gamble, you know, you sit down around a card table, that's not the same thing. But is it legitimate to write a law that constitutes companies that derive profit from the negative characters of mankind? Further, is it proper for the state to, to act as the house to generate revenue from the darker side? Or is it proper for the state to create duopoly, quadopoly, for the purpose of generating revenue out of the darker sides of man's nature? I would say no. It doesn't say that gambling is wrong, but it says that contriving government to take advantage of one group of people at the expense of one group of people to profit another small group of people is definitely wrong. Well, there goes the state lottery. I would agree. I find it entirely repugnant. But I hate crimes. Oh, hate crimes is a, is a beauty. I can show you exactly where it doesn't fit in. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm a, a racist and a bigot. I, I was co-sponsor of a bill to get rid of hate crimes. I, I, had, to, I had to tell uh, Representative Johnson that he had to watch out for me as I had my arm around him. Um, let's see. Which one is it? Right there is a law, there is an article in here which says that, um, which basically addresses equality of rights under the law. And just as the punishment you receive cannot depend on whom you, if the punishment you receive can't depend on whom you are, nor can it depend on who the victim is. I mean, it's, it's really clear, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm missing it at the moment, but we'll probably find it as we go through. Well, that's well and good for New Hampshire laws. But wouldn't it give the, New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire a basis to challenge federal laws? Yeah. Not to necessarily guarantee it to go anywhere, but... Uh, I believe so. Let's, let's look at it this way. Shouldn't be the only challenge. Let's see, article 18. I'm going to put my glasses on to see that. I'm getting tired. You design the punishment. No. No, that's, that's not, no, there's an article that says, there's an article that expressly describes that, uh, oh no, article 18. No, I, um, but we'll find it. Because actually, it's up front. I know it is. Um, but let's take a look at Article 2. All men have certain essential and inherent rights, among which are enjoying and defending life, liberty, and property. Now look at that. Enjoying and defending life, liberty, and property. Acquiring, possessing, and protecting property. And are awarded of seeking and obtaining happiness. Wow, that's good. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, creed, color, sex, or national origin, which would probably have been said gender, not sex. But, um, and that is actually where I pin my statement that uh, equality of rights under the law, as much as it can't depend on whom the perpetrator is, it can't depend upon whom the victim is. I have a question about how that pertains to uh, New Hampshire's death penalty because I believe under New Hampshire state law, you are only eligible for the death penalty if the victim is either a judge or a law enforcement officer. And I agree. And that's discrimination. You're absolutely correct. I agree. I, I do believe in the death penalty. I believe the death penalty we have is unconstitutional because it depends on whom the victim is and not on the crime. Mm -hmm. um, this article borrows directly from the Massachusetts Constitution and from our uh, Declaration of Independence, but most importantly, this and about four other constitutions have 
enjoying and defending life and acquiring, possessing, and protecting property. And most importantly, if you look again at that, that evangelical paradigm, Christian principles would lead you to enjoying life. But if you look at the paradigm of feudalism, okay, you didn't have the right to defend your life against the king. You didn't even own property. Only the king owned property. Anything else was a grant from the king. And if you fell out of favor with the king, he could take all you had and give it to somebody else. You had no right to defend your property. You don't get to the idea of defending life or of protecting property until you get to evangelical principle, in which case there is no, uh, God is no respecter of persons. There's nobody who is innately better than anybody else. That, that last little tidbit there comes uniquely from the evangelical perspective. Evangelical as not what we think of today, the evangelists on TV, but evangelical in terms of the Geneva Bible and the principles of self-government and equality of men. Only there do you get the idea of defending what is yours against all comers. The the other important. Did I have something else? Um, I had a thought flip through. Um, well, there's again the the fabric of the Constitution. Here we have that one of the one of your fundamental rights is acquiring, possessing, and protecting property. Now, if we look at Article 12, let me put there. Usually, for you know, like I'm teaching this in the high school class, I go through in a very linear fashion. But as you, as you folks are much more multitasking, every member has a of the community has a right to be protected by it in the enjoyment of his life, liberty, and property. Okay? The, one of the purposes of government is to protect your rights. And he is therefore bound to contribute his share to the expense of such protection and yield his personal service when necessary. That leads to the militia. Um, but more importantly, taxation, and that's the title, the, the modern title of the, of the article, but we see that taxation and protection are reciprocal. You, your right to protect property is protected by the government, and the government, having protected that right, you are duty-bound to contribute to the funding of that protection. And this leads to something very interesting in the second part. It, it leads to our Article 6, Article 5, which says, who can be taxed, which is inhabitants, residents, and estates. And that is the way it rests to this day. Those are the only entities that can are obligated to pay tax. Corporations are off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We're paying one of the highest corporate taxes in the country here. But there is no authority under Article 6 for the legislation to tax corporations. Now, in Article 6, we say what those Entities in Article 5 can be taxed for. Originally, it was polls in the states. In 1903, we expanded that to franchises, which is businesses. Other, other forms of property, including franchises and property when transferred by will or inheritance. And that's the only transfer authorized. But what's more important at this moment is that we see that what was the only thing that's authorized to be taxed is property which flows back to property and taxation. Our, our protection and taxation are reciprocal. We have protection of property. What is the most visible form that the government, or visible evidence that the government is doing its job of protecting your rights? The acquisition and possession of property. That is the, the edifice that says the government's done its job to protect your right to acquire and possess. Now, interesting to this, as a corollary, is how the different houses of the legislature were originally elected. Taxation and protection are reciprocal. The house has always been elected based on, from districts based upon population. <coughs> but not so the Senate. The Senate, until 1966 or 68, 
Senate districts were allocated based upon equal revenue generation. Taxation and protection are reciprocal. The people are protected and the, and the Senate represented the taxpayers, essentially, and the House represented the tax receivers. And we had that good push me pull you that American government is designed to have. What problem did they change? I can't say for certain, but given the era, I suspect it was uh, one man, one vote. I do have no evidence that it was challenged. I think it was preemptive, and I think it was foolish. Are you talking about the U.S. Senate or the House Senate? Uh, or New, Hampshire Senate. New Hampshire Senate. New Hampshire Senate, okay. okay. I think it was foolish, because if <coughs> challenged, I think it would have stood up to the scrutiny of how our government was organized. Yeah, didn't originally, when you mentioned property taxes, didn't it originally, you have to be a property owner in order to vote. Yes. If you did not own property, or, or you hold could office. not vote. Or hold office. You, you had to hold, hold property to vote to a certain hold office. And you had to have more property to be a senator than you did to be a representative. One of the interesting things, and, and this, is, this is kind of the funny part, um, in 1819 when the court exempted itself from redress of grievances based upon improper commingling of power, and they referenced Madison's comments in, inappropriately in the Federalist Paper 47, what Madison was talking about in Federalist Paper 47 was the inappropriate participation of the judiciary in the deliberations of Parliament. What was at question in the case, Sherburn versus Merrill, was the ability of and the practice of the legislature restoring people to their law. That is, when they got a bad decision, they were denied due process, uh, a judge fell asleep, whatever. They, they, they got a bad decision out of the judiciary, the people could appeal to the legislature to be restored to their law. And that was what the court was fighting. And they referenced Madison's, Madison in Federalist Paper 47, who was specifically talking about the opposite. He was talking about the judiciary participating in legislative debates, even though they had no vote. But he went on, as I said, to describe how wonderful we were because we included that there must be commingling of powers. And he demonstrated his knowledge of the New Hampshire Constitution because he knew at that time that the, that the executive in New Hampshire, until 1792, was a complete creature of the legislature and describes it, which is that the president of the state was the president of the Senate and a voting senator. And the executive council was comprised of three representatives and two senators elected by the body together, the legislative body together, just the same way we elect the Secretary of State and the Treasurer still. So the, 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 you can see in the original design, the legislature held the reins of power. We, we constituted the executive, we constituted the judiciary. And under that scheme, the people's rights were absolute. Because if the legislature did what the people didn't like, they replaced them. One, well, the legislature is part of the Senate. No, I mean, the legislature used to elect the Senate so the people yes, had true. a representative, and the 17th Amendment is what destroyed that. Oh, hey, oh, oh yeah, you're talking, talking about the federal. federal. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and what I'm trying to get at here is the sovereignty of the people. If there's, if there's one thing that I want everybody to walk out of here with at the end of the day is that you're supposed to be in charge. The government, government is supposed to be subordinate to you. It is supposed to do your will, at least as a body politic. 